Hello all and welcome to our seminar here today. Um, it's a great pleasure. Uh, my name is uh, Nikolai Barge from EvoSet. And uh, today, let me just get to speak. And today we have a seminar on ultra sensitive and high throughput proteomics on the standardized EvoSet 1 platform. So um, we have been uh, really trying to spearhead standardized proteomics uh, for the last five years now. It's actually been a while. Um, and we've been on the market with the was it one for, for three years. Um, and we've really tried to, to standardize uh, kind of the platform, the, the LC platform, it was at one with a set of, of standard methods uh, to, to really help um, make proteomics robust and also ensure the throughput needed to eventually uh, go into to the clinical setting uh, and, and, and start to investigate large, much, much uh, larger cohorts of, of samples. So last year at ASMS, we, we launched EvoSet Plus, and that was uh, in order to, um, to allow for, for some more specialized workflows. Um, and, and we do now have a, a few workflows already in the EvoSet Plus environment. Uh, and the latest that we introduced uh, late last year is, uh, is the whisper methods um, uh, for the single cell or really for the ultra high sensitivity work. Um, and yesterday, Dorda gave a really good talk in, in the single cell uh, session um, about some phosphoproteomics um, she did with, uh, with these methods. So if you haven't seen this, I would encourage you to, to uh, maybe revisit and, and see that talk. It was a really nice talk. Um, but today, I think we have a very nice um, uh, agenda. We have two speakers, um, and, and the first speaker of today is going to be uh, Jesper Olsen from CPR at the uh, University of Copenhagen. He will give a, a, a talk on spatial proteomics um, revealed in vivo uh, phosphor signaling dynamics at the subcellular resolution. So I think this is going to be a really nice example of how Jesper used uh, one of our standard methods, uh, namely the, the 60 samples per day method, uh, in combination with the DIA uh, to get really uh, 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 high throughput um, uh, and, and also quite deep uh, proteome coverage, both at the proteome level, but also at the phosphoproteome level. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. Then our next speaker is going to be uh, Erwin Schuf from the Technical University of Denmark. Um, and, and he has been really eager to, to try and, and see what could be done with the WISPA methods for, for uh, uh, the single cell approach where you use the TMT booster strategy. So he's, he's been working really uh, uh, extensively and, and very hard the last uh, few weeks to try and see what would be the, the, the right method, whisper method for this workflow. So here's some very nice and very uh, uh, encouraging data to show. And I'm also really looking forward to, to his talk. So without further ado, um, I would hand it over to Jesper and I'm really looking forward uh, to your talk, Jesper. So let's see if we can just okay. yeah. Okay, I'll try to uh, to share my screen if I can find the right. Uh... This one here. Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks, Nikolai, for the invitation uh, to give you a rundown on some of our recent work where we've used spatial proteomics to analyze in vivo fossil signaling dynamics at a subcellular resolution. And this has really been a dream of mine for a long time. We have been studying uh, fossil signaling dynamics in time but now we are actually also able to do it in, in space. And uh, again, we've used the EGF uh, receptor signaling as our model system, uh, since this is one of the systems where we know how activation of the receptor at the plasma membrane leads to downstream activation of uh, kinase cascades in the cytosol that ultimately leads to uh, phosphorylation of transcription factors in the nucleus that can then exert their function and uh, transcribe genes that uh, in response to the EGF stimuli. 
And in order to study the subcellular uh, proteome and phosphoproteome dynamics, we've developed a very simple uh, so sequential uh, enrichment method where we basically do uh, fractionation using uh, six different uh, biochemical buffers and then analyze both the proteome and phosphoproteome. So we use 5% of the sample for the proteome analysis. And to maximize our proteome coverage, we make use of the uh, FAMES uh, system on the Explorers 480. Um, and as Nikolai already mentioned, we use the 60 samples per day uh, method on the EvoCEP system with uh, 15,000 uh, resolution and a CV of minus 45 on the, the FAMES unit. All experiments are then done uh, with a project specific library that we have generated for each of the fractions to, to match in. And for the phosphoproteome, we then use the remaining 95% of the samples. We also do single shot analysis here and make use of the direct DIA. So we do not need uh, to have spectral libraries in, in this case. And all the samples are then analyzed with uh, uh, spectrum out. And with this workflow, this basically allows us then to profile both the subcellular proteomes and phosphoproteomes using just four hours of MS uh, acquisition time per condition that we're analyzing. And we're very happy to see that this is a very uh, reproducible workflow. So both at the protein level and the phosphocyte level, you can see that in each of the fractions, we are able to quantify uh, around uh, four to 5,000 proteins and uh, roughly the same number of uh, phosphorylation sites. And we can see that all uh, biological replicates uh, cluster very nicely together. And when we look at marker proteins for the different subcellular compartments, we can see that we have a strong enrichment for cytosolic proteins in fraction one and two, membrane bound organelles in fraction three and four, and uh, nuclear and nucleolar proteins in fraction uh, five and six. Uh, the nice thing with using sequential fractionation is that we actually uh, have a direct estimate of the total uh, amount of, of proteins in the sample simply by summing the subcellular fractions. We can see that that correlates very well uh, with the abundance in a whole cell lysate. And for the phosphorylation, this is uh, analysis. This is a very sensitive method. We start with only one uh, P15 dish. And this still allow us to cover more than, than 200 uh, different kinases. And we can see how matching the proteome, where we can see where the kinases uh, are mainly uh, localized, we can see that that also correlates very nicely with their substrates uh, in terms of uh, the phosphorylation. So uh, we believe that this is a very powerful method and uh, to to stress test it, we then used our favorite model system, EGF stimulation of HeLa cells at different time points. So in this case, we used five different stimulation time points, four different biological replicates, analyzed six subcellular fractions for each of them, and both analyzing both uh, signaling layers, both the proteome and phosphoproteome. So in total, 240 samples, which we could then do in just four days of uh, analysis time. And this allowed us to quantify more than uh, 12,000 uh, phosphorylation sites and more than 6,000 protein uh, coding genes. And we are, of course, very interested in capturing uh, the relocalization of, uh, uh, of signaling adapter molecules that we know are activated after the receptor is getting activated by phosphorylation. It will start to recruit uh, cytosolic signaling adapters. And that's exactly what we can see in our time resolved analysis. We can see that the EGF receptor is mainly at the membrane, whereas, for example, some of its known adapter molecules like Sybil, Schick, and Grab2 are mainly uh, in the cytosol bef at, uh, at time point zero. But we can see as soon as we start to uh, stimulate the receptor for different time points that the, uh, the signaling adapter molecules are then transferred from the cytosol to the membrane fraction. And this is... Uh, basically coinciding with the tyrosine phosphorylation of the EGF receptor, that's something that's very uh, kinetic. So where we have maximum phosphorylation of the tyrosine sites after two minutes, and then we have a slow decay. And at 90 minutes, we're basically down uh, to levels that are lower than the uh, initially signaling levels. We can see also downstream molecules are getting activated at different 
sites uh, in the cell. So for example, SHIC, one of the uh, adapter molecules is being tyrosine phosphorylated in the cytosol uh, and in the uh, uh, plasma membrane fraction, whereas transcription factor sustitution is phosphorylated mainly in the nuclear fraction initially and then transferred to the uh, cytosol. So we've previously or recently shown that we can actually also study EGF signaling directly in, in tissue samples. And we have now extended this to uh, also subcellular uh, analysis of the uh, signaling after activated EGF. And in this case, we stimulate uh, mice for 10 minutes with the EGF or with the saline. We perfuse them with protease and phosphatase uh, inhibitors. Uh, excise the liver and, and kidney, and then uh, perform the subcellular fractionation strategy. And from this analysis, we can very nicely identify the same tyrosine phosphorylation sites uh, in the liver of the EGFR. We can see that it actually coincides very nicely uh, with the HeLa uh, analysis at the uh, protein level, but at the phosphorylation level, we can see that although we have activation of the receptor after 10 minutes at the uh, uh, plasma membrane, we actually see a, a large fraction of the phosphorylation sites on the receptor in the cytosol. And that actually coincide with the, um, the cytoplasmic uh, endosomal organelles, so all the early endosomes that are highly enriched in the uh, cytosol fraction. So we have created a web resource database where uh, we have recorded all our data sets. So people can now go in and look for their favorite protein and see how it behaves under different uh, uh, cellular uh, signaling conditions. And you can basically correlate the profiles, both of the, the proteins and overlay then all the individual phosphorylation sites that we have uh, identified for these uh, individual proteins. Uh, to test this on a new uh, system, we've used uh, uh, the osmotic shock response and uh, treated U2S cells with uh, sorbitol for one hour and then performed a washout for 30 minutes, three hours or 24 hours. And again, performed uh, the subcellular fractionation. This led to massive activation of the SAC kinase or MAP3 K20 kinase that is known to be activated by uh, ribotoxic stress. And that's also exactly what we can see that the ribosome, the large and smaller ribosome subunits seems to have quite opposite trends uh, as a function of the uh, osmotic stress response. So we can see that from the fraction two, so that's the cytosolic fraction, we see that the 40S subunit seems to be uh, and the 60S seems to be uh, initially downregulated before they are upregulated again uh, at the later time points uh, during recovery. Conversely, we can see that uh, in the fraction six, which is the nucleolar fraction, that we have a and kind of accumulation of these uh, uh, ribosomal subunits. And that's also uh, revealed. These are the, basically the strongest effect that we can see by from a gene set enrichment analysis uh, of this entire uh, data set. So to, to test what's uh, actually going on, we then performed uh, some immunofluorescence uh, experiment looking at the ribosomal protein. So both those from the uh, large subunit and from the small subunit. And as you may be able to appreciate here that from the large uh, subunit uh, members, we can see that they basically perform this, uh, end up in these kind of puncti after uh, osmotic stress and this is something that is uh, concentration dependent. So we need to, to have at least 250 uh, millimolar um, uh, salt in, in order to induce these uh, puncti formation where the ribosomal subunits are basically sequestered in the uh, nucleoli. And we then performed the Northern blood analysis with uh, different probes covering the large subunit and the small subunit to figure out what's going on. And we can see the probe covering the large uh, subunit uh, ribosomal RNA processing that uh, activating the cells with sorbitol leads to degradation uh, of the ribosomal RNA. And that is probably uh, uh, the reason why we see this uh, stalling of the ribosomes in the uh, 
and the nucleoli. To also test this uh, in a more in vivo model, uh, we used uh, uh, a model, uh, mouse model for uh, muscle contraction, as muscle contraction uh, uh, largely mimics this uh, the mechanical uh, stress that uh, the um, osmotic shock induces. So we uh, analyzed uh, muscles from mice that had been either stimulated or, or resting, and then again, read out the subcellular uh, fractions. And, and again, in this case, we could see that it was actually both the 40S and the 60S uh, ribosomal subunits, where we see a significant decrease in uh, the cytosolic fraction uh, after uh, uh, muscle contraction, whereas we see an increase in the nucleolar fraction of uh, fraction six. Uh, we have uploaded an, uh, a preprint version of our manuscript to BioArchive in, in case you're interested uh, to uh, read further into this. So um, this basically brings me to uh, the conclusions. I hope that I've been able to demonstrate to you that we have developed a subcellular fractionation approach that combined with direct DIA allows us to obtain very fast, sensitive and reproducible maps of the spatial temporal dynamics of both proteome and phosphoproteome level. And we can do it both in vivo in tissues and in vitro in cell lines. We can measure the cellular relocation of EGFR adapter proteins in response to EGF. And we have evaluated this spatial temporal dynamics in cells in response to hyperosmotic shock. We can see that we activate SAC signaling which is known to regulate this ribotoxic uh, response. And as a consequence of this, we see that uh, the large uh, ribosomal subunit accumulate in the nucleola enriched compartments. And this is basically explained uh, in our Northern blood analysis that reveals that the ribosomal RNA processing of the 60S subunit after uh, osmotic shot is uh, hampered. And finally, we can see that the osmotic shot uh, stress mimics uh, the signaling triggered by intense muscle uh, contraction. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the people uh, who did the work. So this was a project that was spearheaded by Anna Martinez de Val in the lab uh, in close collaboration with, uh, Anna, uh, with Dorte Becker Jensen. We've closely collaborated with uh, Fritz of Lund Johansson's group at Oslo University, uh, Alicia Lundby's group at, here at the University of Copenhagen and uh, Simon Becker Jensen's group. We are, of course, uh, very happy with our industry collaborations, especially with Thermo Fisher, uh, with Evosep, with Resin Biosciences, and with uh, Biognosis. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Jesper, for a very nice talk. Uh, and as Jesper said, um, please, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box, and then we will address these at, at the end of the session. So thank you very much, Jesper. And um, while um, uh, Erwin is turning on his screen or he's sharing his uh, screen, um, I can introduce. So, so I mean, we've been working um, in, in the last past months with er Erwin to to try and, and see what Whisper can do um, for his approach, or not his approach, but the approach that he favors uh, to investigate single cell proteomics. As some of you may already know that uh, when we developed Whisper, we were working closely with Matthias Mann and his group in, in Martinsrid, um, trying to look at individual uh, single cells. Um, and that has already been presented and, and we have some very nice data showing this. Um, Irvin is, is, is having or taking a, a slightly different approach where he's using uh, TMT to, to basically to multiplex and also use uh, uh, one channel uh, as a booster uh, to try and, and get the depth. So, so it's been, been uh, quite informative. It's been very uh, interesting to see what Irvin has been, been able to, to do with this. And uh, with that, I would like to, to, to give uh, the word to Irvin uh, to present his talk, which is uh, lever leveraging the power of Whisper for high thru throughput single cell proteomics. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, I assume everybody can see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Um, so I agree. It's been a very exciting month and a half or so that since we started uh, working with Whisper for our single cell proteomics efforts um, that I'd love to tell you a bit more about today. Um, so 
very briefly, just why we're interested in single cell. And, and here at the Department of Bioengineering, we focus, for example, a lot on, on skin with many subtypes, um, bacteria and fungal colonies. Um, in terms of my own research, I'm mainly focused on the blood system and the immune system and the various subtypes and how during the development of malignancy, i.e. cancer, we get this collection of different cell types and especially a cell type known as a cancer stem cell is something I'm very interested in figuring out more how they work and how we can target them therapeutically. And then to do this, we really need a single cell approach. Um, so as Nikolai already showed, indeed we take this um, booster cell approach very basically um, based on the original work um, from Bogdan Budnik and Nikolai Slavov, the scope MS approach, where we can label the, the peptides coming from individual cells with individual TNT tags, pool it with uh, a few hundred cell booster channel. Um, that gets pooled together. Um, and then we run it in this case on the Orbitrap Explorers 480 together with the FAMES Pro device um, for filtering out plus ones. Um, and then we developed this computational pipeline. I will tell you briefly a bit about that uh, in some slides from now uh, called Scepter. And this really helps us visualize the data. So we can do cell clustering. If we have, for example, three cell types, we can visualize how they cluster and whether we can separate them. We can show how many proteins we identified in the individual cells and even visualize um, protein expression levels on the individual cells that we measured to really help visualize uh, and, and see what's interesting. And just to kind of stress why this is complicated and why we love exploring options to boost our sensitivity is the fact that one mammalian cell only contains roughly about 250 picogram. So any boost in sensitivity is uh, very much welcome. So we have a bioarchive manuscript uh, from middle of January um, where we described the workflow. I just briefly wanted to touch on it. I mentioned that it's fax based so we can use an automated cell sorting system to deposit single cells into a 384 well plate containing one microliter of lysis buffer. Um, we use the Dispendex I.1 for uh, non-contact liquid handling and this has the benefit that we can randomize our TMT labeling across the single cells which helps our quality control and data normalization. And then now we use the OpenTrons OT2 um, for pooling of the samples. And, and this is just to show how we prime the, the tips with the booster channel first, we leave it in the plate, and then we go and collect from the 3D4 well plate the single cells that we can then automatically um, pool and collect back in the, the booster plate um, for analysis. So the entire workflow is summarized here. And of course, today I will only focus on the actual low flow chromatography point um, where we feel a lot of benefit can be gained. So before I get to the results, I just wanted to briefly explain why we needed um, this complex data analysis pipeline. Uh, we call it single cell proteomics readout of expression or scepter. And it's really a collection of Python scripts in a Juniper environment. I, it's got a web interface, um, which enables the integration of ScanPy, which is a fantastic RNA-seq um, single cell workflow. And, and it really is a powerful tool to make sense of your data. And, and we basically adapted it for single cell mass spec data. And we do data normalization, because as you can see here, we are dealing with GMT pools and therefore batch effects. Um, but by using an extensive normalization step, we can actually turn these um, injection clusters into actual um, sensible UMAPs uh, where we can start seeing cells spreading according to what we know um, they should. We can do data quality control and, and mainly using the, the sum signal to noise, we can filter out cells where the sample preparation didn't work. And really where it shines mostly is uh, data visualization. So we can look at the fax profile that we used for sorting if we used um, fax. We can then cluster the protein level data um, and then see these three cell types from an AML, a leukemia hierarchy, separating out with blasts and LSCs and progenitors. We can then overlay the fax data um, from those cells and, and confirm that indeed LSC and progenitors are CD34 positive. Um, we can look at cell type specific proteins using volcano plots and again visualize individual proteins onto these um, cellular embeddings. And now we've even incorporated some pathway analysis. And I really can't stress enough how much Benjamin, a PhD student in the lab, has, has uh, spearheaded this work. And it's been really helpful making sense of this. So now to whisper. I mean, 
as most of you are familiar with the EvoCEP, I'm sure um, it, it's a really nice system with these disposable trap columns. And a major difference compared to standard chromatography is the fact that we work with preformed gradients. So we form the gradient through this tip inside the sample loop. And only once the gradient has been built, do we switch the valve and do we push that gradient over the analytical column into the mass spec. And where Whisper is, is distinguishing itself mainly is the fact that we can use very low flow rates, up to 100 nanoliter per minute and, and as low as 50 and 25 nanoliter per minute, which should improve ionization efficiency. So of course, when we got our hands on this, we got very excited and we just wanted to see how does it work on, on our standard uh, 20 nanogram heck lysate QC. And on an Explorers 480, you can see that in a half hour gradient, we're reaching nearly 3000 proteins. Um, on a one hour gradient, we're reaching nearly 4000 proteins. Um, on a new eclipse, we are reaching the 3000 in half an hour and actually go as high as 4500 proteins in the one hour gradient on eclipse. And that translates to about 23,000 PSMs or 400 PSMs per minute um, that we're identifying. So that was really quite unprecedented um, performance in our hands. So for today, I just want to talk about these three methods. We have a two hour gradient, the 10 SPD, a one hour gradient or 20 SPD, and a half hour gradient, which is called 40 SPD. Um, so to do all our testing, um, we basically generated a single cell equivalent sample using the same setup, booster channel, and then um, nine individual TMT channels where we spiked in 250 picogram per channel. So these contain three replicates of these BLAST LSC and progenitor cells, which are known subtypes in our leukemia um, sample of interest. To really assess um, how well this works, we're looking both at quantitative accuracy and precision. And we're also at the same time looking if we can decrease the booster channel amount because we used to use 200 in our preprint. Um, now we're looking at using 100 or even going down to 50 cells. And that's mainly due to this um, carrier proteome effect very nicely described in this publication last year from Chris Rose's lab, where it was shown that if you use high levels of boosting, you need to collect a very high number of ions in order to get robust quantitation. And that's why we're interested in decreasing our amount of booster to make sure we get quantitatively accurate data. So I will now show you the, the three methods and how well it worked. Um, we also evaluated four different injection times at MS2, just to make sure how does the effect of collecting more ions um, affect both the protein numbers, but also the quantitative accuracy. Um, and what was nice to see in, for example, the 40 SPD, you can see that with the transient time injection time of 118 milliseconds, we're already seemingly maxing out the number of proteins. And as we increase injection time, we're just losing the number of proteins. Um, if we then look at 20 SPD, um, we see that we increase our number of proteins when we go to 200 millisecond and, and about the same at 300 and then start dropping at 500 milliseconds, um, suggesting that this is probably the sweet point um, for 20 SPD. And then 10 SPD, we really need this long injection time to reach the maximum number of um, proteins per cell. Again, this is in at least one cell, and in the bottom is the average across all the single cells measured. And then we were keen to investigate whether we could computationally improve the data a little more. And that's why we started playing with MS Fragger um, from the Nesvishki lab, um, which actually did add quite a lot. 20% IDs in the 40 SPD, 15% IDs in the 20 SPD, and 10% more identifications in the 10 SPD. And, and the patterns are the same, so really, maximum injection time on 10 SPD, but we can probably lower them um, in the shorter gradients. And I will explore now why we think that is. Um, as said, we also wanted to investigate if we can lower the number of booster cells. So we compared 100 cell standards to 50 cells. And looking at the protein identification, we can see that we consistently are identifying less proteins, even in the single cell channels. Um, so it's not as straightforward as maybe we um, believed initially. But of course, number of proteins is only half the story. We also got to look at the signal to noise. And here we can see this nice increase in signal to noise as we increase the injection times. And this is the same across the board. Um, but again, we're not seeing 
a significantly higher uh, signal to noise in the 50 cell booster compared to 100 cells, suggesting that it's maybe not worth going lower than 100 cells, at least in our setup and in our cell system. The other thing that was nice to observe was that the short gradients with the very sharp peaks have a, have a high signal to noise. And then as we increase the gradient and thereby um, broadening the peak width, we are dropping in terms of signal to noise. So in order to make sense of what we can trust, we have to look at the accuracy and precision. Because of course it can be highly precise, but very inaccurate. Conversely, you can be very accurate, but have a low precision. And, and that's really, there's two ways that we can measure these two aspects. So accuracy is the measurement error relative to the average. And we can check this by comparing to a known standard, in our case, bulk cell measurements like traditional proteomics. And precision describes the measurement error relative to the standard deviation. And this is how we basically, we analyze some samples in triplicate and then do a CV analysis to check how reproducible they were. So let's talk a bit about the precision of the measurements and again, split across the three gradients. So it was nice to see it was that our, um, so in black, we're showing the number of proteins that we consistently identified across those triplicates. And then in gray are those proteins with a CV less than 20%. So it was nice to see that at the short gradients, it didn't really matter how much injection time we used. Um, we had quite consistent uh, number of highly reproducible quantified proteins. Whereas for 20 SPD, we definitely have to go higher to the 300 and 500 milliseconds. And the same for 10 SPD where 500 milliseconds is minimum. And maybe we need to go even a little bit higher to boost that number. Um, and again, uh, the 50 cell booster did not seem to gain anything in terms of quantitative accuracy over single cell channels. So these results again seem to support that we don't need to go lower than 100 cells. If we then look at these best performing methods uh, where roughly 30% of the proteins have a CV less than 20% and then look at the accuracy. Um, so here I'm comparing our averaged single cell quantitations to bulk MS3 level quant data uh, using the same uh, leukemia sample, but then done in a bulk cell fashion. And, and you will notice that immediately that the correlation coefficients were actually quite promising and across the, the three gradients. Um, so it looks that we are um, quite accurate in terms of our identifications. And we could really validate from this data that it does seem that indeed the extreme short peaks of these high um, or of these low uh, short gradient methods to 40 SPD with a peak width of about four, um, that really boosts the signal to noise. And then as we increase gradient lengths, we decrease the signal to noise and therefore have to increase our injection time to match the quantitative performance. Um, so yeah, to conclude all this data, I mean, I think we could clearly see that WHISPER allows for balancing cell throughput and proteome coverage while being able to benchmark the quantitative accuracy, which is extremely important dealing with these low um, sample amounts. I mean, the scope of being able to run 560 cells per day is really something that we would all be very keen on, I think, in the single cell field. Um, I mean, you could run 10,000 single cells in, in less than three weeks um, running this method. And as we saw, we are getting about 400 proteins per cell average. So it's not even terrible. Of course, we all have the magic um, threshold of 1,000 proteins per cell minimum at this point and would like to boost that. But it, it's actually quite good performance given that they're only half hour runs. And if we have the number of cells, we almost double the number of proteins. And then going to 10 SPD, we see that we are matching um, our previous performance as in our uh, preprint of about 900 proteins per cell on average. And we were actually using three hour gradients before. So we only had about 112 cells per day throughput. So the 10 SPD does really seem to be a good candidate for increasing throughput of single cell proteomics. Um, so I hope I showed that the peak width directly correlates with the gradient length and thus the required MS2 injection time for sufficient quantitative accuracy. Um, so we have very short peak width, um, only as high as 15 seconds for the 10 SPD method. And therefore we see that these injection times 
um, are the respectively best injection times for, for retaining uh, good quantitative accuracy with a 100 cell uh, booster. Lowering booster cell numbers beyond 100x does not seem to improve signal to noise in single cell channels. So that was quite interesting. And, and we will investigate this a little further, perhaps with nanopods or something that, that does change. Um, MS Fragger adds a lot of more single cell IDs, especially in the short gradients, up to 20% more IDs. And at the moment, we're looking at investigating also the WISPR 50 and WISPR 25 nanoliter per minute flow rates, because this should provide additional performance benefits. So with that, uh, I'd especially like to thank Benjamin and Nil, who are PhD students that joined uh, the effort to get single cell mass spec uh, running really well. Of course, Bo, my former postdoc mentor, um, for kind of supporting uh, this work uh, to the max. Colleen for helping with cell sorting. Eva Sepp, who's a lot of fun working with Nikolai, Ola, and Dora. Uh, the D2 Proteomics Core, the DIC Lab, um, various of our technology partners like Thermo. Um, and of course, funding and the various affiliations I've had. And thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Erwin, for a very nice talk. Um, I think, so if, first of all, if you have any questions for Erwin, please put them into the Q&A box. Uh, and also if you have questions for Jesper. Um, and and I, I guess it's, it, I should state that that all this was really done to try and, and find the optimum method for, for, for this TMT booster strategy. Uh, and as Irvin says, we're not done yet kind of seeing what are the best compromises in terms of, of throughput and sensitivity, basically performance. Um, but, but hopefully at some point we'll find the right length, the gradient, um, and also the right flow rate. So, so let's see, um, it's still a work in progress, but, but it does look very encouraging. So, so right now the 10 SPD is, is not kind of yet available. Uh, it is that the 40 and 20 SPD uh, whisper methods uh, at 100 nanometers per minute that's available. But uh, we'll have a lot more information about this uh, in the in the coming future. Um, so yeah. So, and we also have Jesper online. That's great. Um, so I think uh, the first uh, question is uh, from UBC Vancouver uh, for Jesper. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, please, what is the starting amount of proteins for your phosphor analysis workflow for each sample dash fraction? Yeah, so uh, we're actually not measuring the, the how much protein we have. I mean, we start with one P15 dish, so we know it's around maybe a milligram of, of protein, and that's then being sequentially uh, split into six different fractions. So maybe at best we have 200 micrograms in in a fraction, uh, which is also the amounts that our workflows have been optimized for, for the phosphor enrichment. Mm -hmm. But some fractions we can see we have much lower phosphorylation coverage than others. So obviously in the cytosolic fraction, we have more proteins and many more uh, phosphor proteins than for example, in the fraction that contains the ER, Golgi and mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So the next question is for you, Evan. Um, so thanks, Evan, uh, for providing the EvoSet uh, data on the TMT approach. It's really important to look at the signal to noise and protein CVs as we are moving from uh, qualitative to quantitative. In the single cell signal to noise, are these numbers per cell or total in each run? Um, so yeah, that's a great question. So indeed, the signal to noise is averaged across all the single cell channels of each injection. So it is kind of a, a median uh, signal to noise that we were measuring here, which is of course heavily dependent also on the number of proteins um, that you measure. So that's why the, the scale is probably not directly comparable between the methods and, and why we're seeing similar quantitative accuracy uh, between them while having quite different signal to noise levels. Perfect. Thank you very much, Evan. Again, if you have questions, please uh, put them into the chat box. Um, so uh, I actually have a question for you, uh, Jesper, uh, just out of curiosity. How, how, many, how many samples um, did you actually analyze in, in the study that you talked about? Yeah, so basically for each of the two cell line-based studies, uh, we analyzed 240 samples each, so that's like 480. And for the... Um, um, the tissue samples, we were only looking at uh, two uh, conditions. So 
that was like 120 samples for each of them. So altogether, more than a thousand samples that we have analyzed. Yeah, yeah. So 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 a pretty big study. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So a, a question for for you, Irvin. Um, um, as I said, we, 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 we've really been trying to find the ideal kind of conditions for, for, the, for a method, right? And, and what are your thoughts about, from, based on kind of the, the knowledge that we have so far of, of the length? I mean, do you think, is it, is it going to be 10 SPD or is it going to be, be less? Um, that's going to be the, the, the optimum for throughput and, and sensitivity uh, for the CSO work. Yeah, no, that, that's indeed the, the thing we have to figure out soon. Um, probably because it is this balance of peak width versus injection time and if we have shorter peak widths we can run shorter injection times uh yeah shorter cycle times and therefore get more protein so i think based on the data we've seen i mean we we can definitely reach a thousand proteins per cell on the 10 spd i think with a little bit of tweaking we should be able to do the same with for example a 15 spd um, of course, we're also looking at MS3 level quant versus MS2 um, that might need the 10 SPD um, simply because you have a bit longer cycle time there, um, which would already be a big boost for us. I mean, we're not doing any kind of computational magic here to boost the protein number. So if 10 SPD already gives us that raw 1,000 proteins per cell, we're already very happy with a 30% increase in throughput compared to our previous setup with uh, Easy Spray. Um, so I'm hoping 15 SPD could get it done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, another question for you, uh, Irvin. Um, uh, I was wondering how you deal with missing values in your single cell samples. Yeah. Again, that's uh, the crux of it all. Um, definitely, imputation is is needed. As in, not needed, but it helps kind of increase the number of proteins you can compare across your cells. I mean we're having about 45% missing values from run to run. So indeed you might be identifying thousand proteins per cell, but then between two cells, it's only like 550 proteins you can compare. So it is something that we have to deal with. And we have in our um, preprint evaluated different kind of um, settings for this imputation. How often should you impute? How many cells should you have seen it in before you impute it in the other cells? And that's something you have to do on a data set uh, specific basis, but you can read more in our preprint on that. Okay, thank you very much. So we just have uh, one and a half minutes left or something like that. So uh, a last question, and, and this is a qu question for both of you. How would you perform single cell proteomics in the context of tissue biopsies or blood cells? So maybe if you go first, uh, uh, Jesper. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, this is actually the area of expertise of, of Irvin, but uh, I guess that we are very uh, uh, excited about the DIA and the labor-free quantification that's already been shown by Matthias Mann's lab, that that's actually possible to do single cell uh, proteomics to a depth of around 3000 proteins from, from single cells. So uh, that would probably be the, uh, the strategy that, that uh, we would take, I guess, for tissue biopsies, I mean, you would have to do some kind of cell sorting first, uh, equivalent to what, what Irvin is, is doing. And uh, yeah, of course, with blood cells, you, you know that uh, the, the white immune cells, they're usually much smaller than, <laughs> than other cell types. So, so that's an uh, yeah, additional challenge, uh, but maybe Irvin can yeah, say a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, definitely agree. I mean, we've done all our work on blood cells so far because they're easy to sort. They like going through a, a high pressure liquid system. Um, they seem to, to work well um, in terms of number of proteins we can extract, um, but this is yeah, primary samples like the, the stem cell compartment rather than the more differentiated cells, which probably express a less diverse proteome. Um, indeed, tissue biopsies, I mean, Maybe we are looking more at the, the LCM workflow from Matthias Mann, where, where you can cut out single cells and then analyze them, um, whether that's in a multiplexed or a, a DIA approach, like Jasper also alluded to. I think both will work very well. Um, and it's, it, it is always this matter of throughput versus proteome depth. Um, if you can dissociate them, which I guess Jesper was doing with the subcellular fractionation, then you might be able to actually fact sort them. Um, so that, that 
probably works very well um, also in, in terms of single cell. Um, okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, both of you, for two fantastic talks. And thank you all for listening in and participating in our seminar. Uh, time is unfortunately, unfortunately up. But if you want more information, feel free to reach out and also maybe visit our website, evosep.com, where you can find a lot more information about everything. So have a great uh, uh, conference, virtual conference, and take care, guys.